think that's an interesting thing. This one piece will make 52 layers. Watch on mobile devices or the big screen. All for free. No subscription required. Download Veely now. is the market leader in youth holidays, giving our great British youth the trip of a lifetime every time, every summer. We're here. Give it to us. Give us everything. Sun, sea and sex. I think those three words sum up for me. This is an orgy of unadulterated hedonism. Young kids that don't give them monkeys. And why not? I can drink more, I can smoke more, I can shag more, I can do anything I want to do now. I'm out of the UK, it doesn't really matter what I do. This year, Club 1830 believe that their clientele are open to a more sophisticated message. But while their Be On The List campaign might be more subtle in tone, the message is still appealing to the inner party animal of British youth. For years, Club 1830 has merrily stumbled through the back streets of the Med, giving thousands the time of their lives for 10 to 12 nights, half bored only. But for some holidaymakers, it's been a cul-de-sac of curse, full of chaos, misery and pain. The next thing I knew, I was waking up to a pile of hair next to me. We were met with what I can only describe as pure hysteria. I laid on my bed, head in my hands, holding my eyes where it's hurting so much. And the reps that lead the charge can be cursed as well, ending their days exhausted and unemployed. I had bites on my leg that turned green. Um, I was so run down, so ill and so tired. We had to resign because it was just getting so hot out there for us, you know what I mean? And a result that caters for Club 1830 can be cursed and left to rot. From past experience, wherever Club Bagnon Hood has been, the resort's been cursed. So how did it ever get so cursed? British summer holidays used to be closer to home and so civilised. Walks on the pier, slot machines and family fun. But then the teenager was invented and it all kicked off. Sex and boozing, and in some cases fighting, have always been part of the fortnightly holiday. But why booze, shag and fight in the rain when Spain and the sun was just a short flight away? The 60s saw a blossoming of cheap package holidays to the Costas and in 1965 some bright spark started selling cheaper night flights to the nation's young adults. Club 1830 was born and by the 1980s they were selling more than just a holiday. It was the shame, shame, shame adverts, where for the first time they had really scantily clad women. And that was unheard of at the time, and, and everybody was completely shocked. Shame on you, if you can't come to. 1830 have really gone out to, to kind of push the market um, and to, to appeal to the fact that, you know, these, these days young people do want to push the boundaries more and more and more. You know, almost nothing is too shocking now. And if you look at those commercials, what they've done is they've really picked up on that, you know, from scantily clad women to really very overtly sexual adverts. And, and then the dog ads, which have been running recently, you know, they kind of even stray into the areas of bestiality. The reaction of young people was, I want to go on one of those holidays because it's like that. Um, there's going to be lots of sex and lots of fun. I've got to do it. Last summer saw 150,000 youths packing their teeny-weeny bikinis and their big baggy Bermudas and head off for the packaged holiday of a lifetime for a week. For some of them, it's the first time they've actually been in an opportunity where they, they can go home after they've been drunk and not worry about parents, you know, waking up their parents by vomiting in the bathrooms. What 1830 boils down to is sort of a rite of passage in a bag. You know, it's like a microwave sex and drink holiday. Leave the microwave on for too long and things can get very messy indeed. Oh, there's something very scary about it. There is an image now that they all go around out of their minds. There's certainly this dangerous I'm on holiday, therefore I'm invincible vibe. And causing a dickens of a, you know, nuisance to other people on holiday around them. Club 1830 has now infested every corner of the Med, allowing us to let our hair and our pants down in the heat. 
their sex every night and every day. Every opportunity they had, they were at it like rabbits. Rabbits or beaver? Excess in all its forms was normal, promoted by the club as their common currency, and so effective were bulgingly provocative ads like this that booking soared. But summer 2003 saw this dirty boil burst. Suddenly, the world of excess that Club 1830 had created collapsed around their very ankles as their reps were singled out by the curse. Adam Walker and Vinnie Sagu were left jobless when the curse exploded in an orgy of their own making. I don't think I've been that pissed and for a long, long time. I don't actually remember standing on the stage. I remember looking up and seeing yeah. people and looking down, and, but I didn't really think nothing of it. They'd taken two boatloads of holidaymakers on a booze cruise that had turned into the mother of all drinking competitions. Everybody was just mashed. We were coming off the boat. We were coming. So somebody nicknamed it the Cruise of Filth. Like we were coming off the yeah. boat, and they were chanting it. Yeah. Were, cruise of Filth. Cruise of Filth. And it was then that a rival rep suggested they prove their filthy claims. So they did, and this led to their undoing when a local Greek atelier copped the lot on film. I know. You, yeah. I mean, you've got your own common sense and everything, but we're there to entertain the guests, and that, that was what it was about. I think solely just to entertain them. And we didn't have to do much, really. We just stood there and just uh, took it. <laughs> but, you but, know... Yeah, we... we've, we've been asked a few times about this as well, like, uh, was it entertainment or was it a sexual uh, act or whatever? But uh, we've said it we've said a hundred times, there was nothing sexual about it at all, you know? It was just something on the spur of the moment, the heat of the moment, that we did, and uh, it's... Uh... It, was, it was solely due to entertain people and give them a giggle. What? To clear this mess up, we brought in the UK's number one expert to get the facts straight. I'm the UK's number one porn star. And showed her the pictures to get a professional opinion. That is definitely a sexual act. That is oral sex. There's no denying that. When you've got somebody's cock in your mouth, that's oral sex. So, that's that then. I think what happens is you... You go over the line. Once you've gone over the line once, you forget, and you go over again and again, and then you're, by then you're so far down, and then someone comes down and goes, oh, hey, what are you doing? And you're like, oh, yeah, sorry, we got a bit carried away. And then about a few days later, I heard that the British press were coming over and stuff like that. It was just adding, you know what I mean, more fuel to the fire, to say the least. And then just to put another spanner in the works, we found that the police were starting to investigate it and we could be up for charges of uh, lewd behaviour and also Debauchery and stuff. Debauchery and uh, stuff. I think if you've been given a blowjob on a beach and you're a rep, then you should be sacked. Because I think it comes down again to this idea of responsibility. There is this kind of aspect of the holiday as a package that you're going to be looked after. I just felt like there was a noose around my neck and I just felt like, you know, everywhere I go, I, I think people are looking at me and the Greeks are talking and stuff like that. And they, they weren't happy, you know what I mean? Because obviously we, we you know, brought disrepair to like the, the country. Disreputably disrepaired, the boys had to resign. At the time, Paul Little, Club 1830's overseas director, said the reps resigned before we could sack them, and then added, what upset me more was that they'd been drinking in the day. We enjoyed our job, we loved our job. Yeah. Uh, it's just we, a shame, we had a good time. It is, it is a shame. But we, we made our beds, so we've got to line it, really. Yeah, whoever it be with, we we <laughs> After the break, the curse of Club 1830 traps more reps in a cycle of inebriation. Someone challenged me and said, could you drink a bottle of aftershock in half an hour? Exhaustion. You'd go in there and sit on the toilet for about five minutes, think, how long could I waste? And exhibitionism. The guests have paid for you to see your boobs, and all honesty, that's, that is what, you know, everyone, want, everyone wants to shag a rep, doesn't they, at the end of the day? For the last 40 years, Club 1830 has been party central for holidaymakers and reps alike. For most people in this country who haven't got much money, those two weeks in summer are the best two weeks of their lives, OK? Now, if you get offered a job where that two weeks can become a whole year, and all, every night you get to drink and you get to socialise and you get to meet the opposite sex, then no wonder it's the dream job. And TV celebrated this dream as the reps lived it. An all-work and all-play lifestyle that created reality styles and even its very own drama. It seemed a rep's life was a cocktail of bottomless booze and easy love. Wrong. 
they were cursed. Little did these reps realise that when they first signed up for the summer. You've got to have balls. That's what it says when you go for your job. It says, have you got the balls to do this job? Being a club rep, I think, is probably one of the closest things that I've ever been to being famous. Essentially, they're, they're treated like local pop stars. You know, they get into, they get into bars and clubs for nothing. They're adored by their sort of 50 or 60 clients. All the girls want to talk to you, all the guys want to be uh, You go into the bars, everybody recognises you. you. You know what I mean? You're, you're just absolutely the dawn. The curse preys on the unwary. But for some, it's a job in the sun and a summer of fun with no consequences. But for others, yep, it's cursed. At the end of the day, you've got to be like a sad cartoon character. You've just... Way! Way! I'm Club 8030 Ref, I've got this badge and it means I can do anything kind of thing. And then it hits in when it starts to get busier and busier and the lack of sleep and the abuse you get and the, the complaints and everything else. Then you kind of realise, right, I am a Club 8030 Rep and this, this is what it's all about. It is bloody hard work, you know, you, you, you survive in like four or five hours, um, sleep, a, sleep a night, there's lots and lots of pressure, you're with the clients 24 seven. So I'm, make no mistake, it's a, it's a very, very difficult job and you have to dig deep into your natural resources to, to do that job. As a club rep, you're paid 75 quid a week and your only chance to make some real money is to sell your soul and a few excursions door to door. We had keys because I worked in apartments, so many a times I went in with my keys and literally got them out of bed, literally dragged them out of bed. Come on, you're going to the local meeting. All the holiday makers arrive there and they all want to make friends and they all make friends and then inevitably the booze cruises and the things that they've heard about as part of the holiday are extras. You describe all the trips and then it was sell, sell, sell. Sell, sell, sell. Sell, 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 sell. Two to three hundred people go mental in some of the most happening gigs in Falaraki. A block of excursions was typically a beach party. Phone parties, you've got school discos. We had a bar crawl. And that is the essence of where they make their money. You know, the, the, the tour reps go down there, they get paid a very low basic wage, they're provided with accommodation, they make their money selling excursions. I do think the reps do get it hard, you know, if you don't hit a certain target, you're sacked. I mean, how harsh is that? They can just say, well, you're not up to scratch, you're not what we need, and they can just get rid of you. There's about 20,000 other people sitting in the beer list waiting to, you know, fighting for that job. So good, honest folk once made rep are bent to the will of the curse. Deep down, a lot of the trips weren't value for money. You know, we were charging maybe £20 for people to come out on a bar crawl. You know that you're not actually having to pay to get into the nightclubs, you're not paying to get into the bars, and yet they've just paid £20 for a shot, which probably cost the people about a pound. Club 1830 claim they can tailor trips to suit any tastes, but if your taste is michelin star food, forget it. There were worst hamburgers and the worst hot dogs you've ever had. Not even the reps ate anything. We ate the chips and that were it and it just generally turned into a food fight at the end of it because no-one liked it. I began to learn that unless I sold them, I was not going to eat and I wasn't going to get any money at the end of the week, so you just start lying. At least the reps usually had a receptive audience because the audience were usually pissed. Yes, we invented binge drinking and now our nation's young need a little encouragement to fly the flag. I think these holidays are an extension of Saturday night out down the boozer, but where you've only got two hours to enjoy yourself, you've got, you've got two weeks just to go mad and the bar doesn't close. So it's like a pressure cooker, it's almost like a release. And all of a sudden, uh, the lid comes off, and it's as simple as that. There is The control goes, and the UK binge drinking culture really is unleashed. And the curse has created even more devious and multicoloured ways to help that binging. Well, it's an experience having a fishbowl. You'll have one in your lifetime and probably won't have another one again. The famous fishbowl, it is, is like it sounds, it's a huge bowl and it literally is just filled with as much alcohol as you can possibly fill in it. It's just the quickest way to send you on a one-way trip. And you just pour as much alcohol as you can and people just drink it as quickly from straws as possible. They're bloody horrible anyway. They're only there to get you pissed. Have one of them and you, you'll be away with the fairies. Today, Club 1830 say they've completely dropped bar crawls. But their brochure also states, we are not moral guardians. What you do on your holiday is 100% down to you. If you want to drink on holiday, you drink. If you don't, you don't. I drank a lot, yeah. I must admit, I've breakfast was one of the worst after July. 
I used to come and have breakfast, I used to have a pint of lager and after shock with my breakfast. And then at the end of the day, everybody would do the same, they'd all have a pint and after shock. You think about it now and you think that was stupid, you shouldn't have done it, but then it didn't seem stupid at all. Your tolerance level for alcohol got more and more and more as it, you know, as the weeks went on, so you'd have to drink more and more and more to get more drunk. Curse isn't out to win the battle of hearts and minds, it's out to win the battle of liver and kidney, and thanks to the demon drink, the reps can end their days on their knees, literally. I think the culture among the reps is completely, completely bizarre. It's a pack mentality and you have to get involved, you have to be part of the group, and you have to kind of do what's expected. You know, if you don't, you don't fit in. Someone challenged me and said, could you drink a bottle of after shock in half an hour? So I said, right, let's go, get your stopwatch, go, let's go. And at first they were flying down one after the other. I'd done about 15 shots and then I felt this. Because I'd already had 10 before and I'm thinking, I've got this whole bottle to do. Got to the last one and I drank it. It was something like 28 minutes and 32 seconds I drank it in. I hit outside and I collapsed on the floor, straight into the heat from the air conditioning. And my boss come along and she went, are you drunk? And I went, yeah. She went, right, go home. But my guests had heard that I was being sent home because I was too drunk to work. And the curse hadn't quite finished with Simon yet. They handcuffed me to the bar. They were pouring more aftershock, vodka, everything down my neck, and I couldn't move from the bar. They let me out at about 8 o'clock in the morning. And um, they carried me over to my room and put me on my bed and I had to be at work in an hour. From the first night, the alcohol is there and the atmosphere is there for you to go mad. We're seeing role models effectively created which encourage young people to drink. Um, we're actually seeing a doubling in the level of people dying of liver-related diseases um, because of alcohol consumption. It's a big problem here. It's a big problem abroad as well. And it's the reps who are the agents of this madness because the curse blinds them to the extremes they're promoting. If you're being told to meet at seven to drink absinthe and tequila and sambuca mixed, I mean, that, OK, it's controlled, but in the sense that somebody's giving it to you, you know, and almost forcing it upon you. With the reps cursed to lead these binges, it's inevitable that they'd invent their very own cocktail to drown the holidaymakers in curse as well. With this bowl of shame, it's really bad. Oh, I think it contravenes every health and safety and everything. I oh. can't believe we did it, but like, what you do is you start it off and, and uh, it'd be if you get caught drinking in your right hand or scratching your bollocks or something like that, <laughs> and uh, you'd have to do a drink from the bowl of shame in front of everybody and you'd have to get up on this big bar like this and you'd have to, you'd have to knock it back and stuff like that. And if you spewed, you'd just have to spew back in the bowl of shame. This cocktail did have coffee, yeah. mustard, Everything fish, you could possibly imagine. And pits of skin, pubic hair, and we'd vomit in That's it. That's a cocktail, not one just with, like, uh, vodka in it and, stuff. and stuff. And then you'd say, right, you, come over, get a glass, drink it. And for some weird, stupid reason, they'd go, all right, then, and they'd it, and they go, wait, yeah. and they'd neck it. And then someone else would want to do it as well, <laughs> and then someone else would want to do it. Like, We've just chucked up you're in You're drinking and our spew. The feeling of escapism actually does encourage people to behave in a more outlandish way than they would ever dream of doing in the UK. If you go out to any holiday resort, you can see it. You know, actually, people who would, you know, in many cases be quite conservative back in the UK, literally getting their rocks off. And for the reps, the curse has normalised all sorts of behaviour, no more so than when it comes to the infamous reps cabaret. Cabaret is the best. You've, always, the you've best always got some bar. girls or some guys that fancy or some of the guys think, oh, that rep's pretty fit and stuff like that. <laughs> Your reps are going to get the kit off tonight. Bear, my nickname was Bear. Although not part of the holiday as advertised, naked reps became an unofficial bonus. The girls had to always lose their tops and the guys just went full nudity in, in the cabaret. And uh, it was very funny, but there were a couple of the reps that weren't comfortable at all with doing it. Some girls are obviously a lot bigger, so it's quite daunting for them even to wear a G-string and a bra, let alone show your boobs. I yeah, love it, I love getting the boobies out. Pushing so the, the, the customers expect it, they want you to be one of them. So it's not surprising, actually, that, you know, the cabaret shows now, you know, involve a high level of nudity and, and uh, you know, even worse in some cases. We started off where we, we were just in like very tight tops and, and little skirts and things. But as time went on, the pressure did kind of come on, you know, a bit of time you showed a bit of this and that. And then it kind of got down to now it's going to be bikini tops. Everybody's got to go out and get a black bikini top or a black bra. And then it was kind of right this week, what we're going to do is you're going to have to take your bras off, but we, you know, you won't have to show anything because you could be covered with plates. Most of them were fine about it, maybe one or two might um, they'd take the top off and they'd do the pose 
with their hands across their chest or something like that, so they don't, you know what I mean, they're not getting them out, shaking it all about the place. We were made to deliberately drop plates so that people would be exposed, and, and in the end, they kind of tied your hands behind your back. It goes with the job. If you're going for a job yeah. like that, then you know that that situation's going to turn up. It's a very difficult situation to be in, you know. I mean, for a rep, you can't really take individual responsibility and say, right, I'm not going to do this because, because of the peer and corporate pressure that you're under. If there's peer pressure for girls to get their tits out, they must be mad because absolutely not. That's, that's wrong and it just gives the whole wrong image. How can you one minute be getting your tits out and doing stupid things like that and then the next minute helping someone if they're drunk or going down the police station sorting something out for someone? If you've got 20 guys like rugby players and you're getting your tits out for them, you're going to get in all sorts of trouble. You know, you, you, where do you draw the line? No, it's wrong. And just when the female reps might think it's safe to come out at night, the curse of the curse strikes with a vengeance. Normally when the thong's on, all the girls get up and show their thongs up. So all the reps got up and even if they had big knickers, small knickers, whatever they did, they got up on, they got up on the bar and, you know, and showed the knickers. And I was actually on my period, so and I had a sanitary towel on, and I was, you know, boss said to me, you know, go up, and I said, no, I can't, I've got a sanitary towel on. And she's like, no, you're going up. And I was just like, no, I cannot go up. I've got a great big bloody sand, dirty sanitary towel, really attractive looking, his wings hanging out. But it was just like, come on, up you get, get on the bar, show your knickers. And I was like, no. I didn't get up, I refused point blank. There was no, no way I was getting up. I'm not degrading myself like that. God, can you, would you honestly want to see my sanitary towel? No! And if you need a lie down after that, well, it's totally understandable, but there is no rest for the wicked, and even less if you're a cursed club rep. You've got to be active, you've got to be lively. 24 hours a day, you've got to be just on the ball all the time. You can't show a sign or oh, you're sleepy, you're tired or whatever, you know what I mean? You work from 9 o'clock in the morning, roughly, till 2 the following morning. We didn't have a day off, basically. We had to work seven days a week. I have like 18 hour days minimum. <laughs> yeah. Especially in the sun times. I remember my first day work, I didn't sleep for two days. Many times I was in tears through exhaustion and um, my whole voice used to change. I used to go husky for six months. I used to sound like Bonnie Tyler because all the screeching and shouting. You've got spunk on your head! <laughs> So it is pure exhaustion. Hearing disco music all the time, you just, oh, dash your head in, you just don't want to hear it anymore. You don't want to go to clubs anymore. It's like, no, I just want to sleep. I just want to be really boring. I certainly know of reps who, you know, have, have had to go home through exhaustion. They've had panic attacks. They've gone to hospital, you know, with liver problems, you know. And you, you do, have, after a while, you do have to kind of have to take a step back and just go, whoa, and, you know, just sort of wind your neck in a little bit. If you went to a club after the trips, the best bit of the night was sneaking into the toilets, literally to have a sleep. You'd go in there and sit on the toilet for about five minutes, think, how long could I waste in here just for a little sleep? Just go into the toilet, just put a seat down, sit there, and that was it. You were out like a flash, instantaneously. So you wouldn't need to lock yourself up 15 minutes, get up, and then that's it. You'd be sorted for a little couple more hours and stuff like that, or, you know what I mean? Desperate, really desperate. Um, I haven't really felt that sort of tired ever again. Come on, boys and girls, don't give in to the curse now. Don't let it beat you. This is the best job in the world. You'd have to get promoted after two seasons, otherwise you'd burn out. And I had burnt out completely of being a club rep. Anybody who reps more than three years has got, without, without looking at it in a, in a career perspective, without moving on to management or whatever, has got serious psychological problems. Because to, to do that job for that length of time, you've got to be absolutely mad. I would never go back again. Ne I'd never be a club any 30 rep again. I'd had enough and uh, I couldn't do it anymore. You know, you, you change. You're not as naive. You can't put up with as much crap anymore. You're exhausted. You just don't want it anymore. So it's time to head home along with all the others. But that's when you discover the true curse of being a rep. You're trapped in a netherworld of excess from which there is no escape. I think for a lot of people who become a rep, it is a curse because then they're in the repping lifestyle and then what do you do? When you'd first get back, you'd be still a bit kind of hyper, like reppy, and your friends would be like, oh, stop being a twat, you know, you're not a rep now. During the winter, they, you know, they're, they're just in crap jobs, you know, they've got no social life. Your friends are working in an office, they're getting up at seven, they can't get pissed all night with you. And so you're kind of a bit of a lonely figure in the bar and 
from saying never again, it nearly killed me, you're signing on the dotted line for next year because what else? After the break, the curse wreaks havoc on the holidaymakers themselves as we uncover Rachel and Vanessa's porn shame. They were a bit shy, but after that, they let their hair down. They were fine with Antica. <laughs> Aisha questions herself. <laughs> Sex crazed Aisha. Um, no, Aisha wants to have a good time. And Georgina loses it. The next thing I knew, I was waking up to a pile of hair next to me. Every summer, the cream of British youth pour out of the UK and into the Med, expecting their Club 1830 holiday dream to come true. It's a real kind of get it while you can, stuff your boots for a week, two weeks, and then go home and brag to your mates. They're shagging themselves stupid, you know, getting drunk and falling over. Go, go, go. Go, go. People must have felt dreadful, to be honest, because they'd be drinking all day, then go out to the bars at night, so they were continually sort of drunk. There's certainly this dangerous, I'm on holiday, therefore I'm invincible vibe. But the curse had been waiting for a chink in that invincible armour. Claire Morris from Coventry was the first victim to feel its all-consuming power when she booked on a last-minute break to Kavos in Corfu with her mate. I suppose, realistically, we should have realised that for how much we pay for the holiday, we weren't going to get a five-star hotel. When we got to our room, we were absolutely disgusted. The walls had blood on them, there was no hot water, and there was a hole at the bottom of the tiled bathroom floor where water came bubbling back up. But girls, Club 1830 say it how it is. If it's basic, we say it's basic. Basic accommodation is the name of the game, it has to be said. You, you don't want to be putting anything in the room that can be broken, thrown out of a window from 13 storeys up, um, that can't easily be replaced. So you go for minimalism. What we really wanted was to go home by this point. But on their last night, when the girls were safely tucked up in bed, the curse lit the touch paper. We started hearing screaming and shouting um, that we realised something wasn't quite right. So I said to my friend, you know, could she hear all this, um, all this noise? She said yes. Um, and then she said, could I smell burning? So she got up out of bed and she opened the door to be engulfed with black smoke. We panicked initially um, and then we decided we had to get out. We were met with what I, what I can only describe as pure hysteria. People screaming, shouting, people crying. It was seven o'clock when the reps came along. Um, they offered us a crate of hooch um, and said that we should get drunk and relax a little bit. To be offered a crate of hooch as compensation for something as horrific as, you know, a near-death experience in a fire, it is just kind of part of the, the mentality. You know, the mentality is that everything can be sold by getting pissed and getting a shag. Of course, fires are unpredictable and Club 1830 can't be held accountable, but offering up a crate of booze, now that's inflammatory stuff. And Claire has never truly escaped her ordeal. That's a fire alarm. <laughs> Jesus, pepped. Strike a light. It's not even safe to sleep when the curse is on the prowl, and not even a discotheque filled with foam can extinguish its malign influence. If you imagine opening the, the door to your dishwasher or your, your washing machine when it's in full flow and watching the suds come spurting out of your kitchen, it's flying at you in incredibly large quantities from above. My advice to anybody going to a phone party would be go once for the experience and never go again. Sound advice, Jules. Craig Pike from Malmesbury in Wiltshire did just that. After he went to his first phone party in Malia on Crete, he wasn't exactly crying with laughter, and nor was his mum. You just think, well, they'll go away and they'll come back all safe, and all... but it didn't turn out like that. Oh, no. That was the first phone party I went to, um, and basically I thought about it before my mates had been to him. I thought I'd try it, see what it's like. It just goes everywhere. You can't see half the time, and it's like soapy water. Once it goes in your eyes, it does start to sting. This is the curse using the appliance of science. We've been in there a good couple of hours or so. Um, 
it, and once you've been in there that long, your eyes start to really hurt. So you, you just think, right, that's enough's enough. We just like left, uh, went outside. Um, that was when I realised it was really hurting and a job to see. It was like it was really foggy, but then you could see really vague shadows. It's like people, you had problems seeing them, but it's just like you could roughly see buildings, but not clear enough to walk. After a sleepless and painful night, the local clinic slapped ointment and eye patches on our hapless hero. So I had these patches put on. I had to have sunglasses to hold them on because they obviously they wouldn't stick where it's so hot. So there's me walking around with sunglasses holding these patches on and everyone's like laughing, thinking, oh, look, what's happened to you? On his return home, he would only have his mother for comfort. He was walking with his hands stuck out in front with patches over his eyes and I was absolutely horrified and his mate said, oh, he's all, it's all right, he's just temporary, temporary blinded. And with that, I burst into tears and thought, oh, my God, what's happened to him? Yes, Craig's cursed forever because his eyes still haven't recovered. He's left him with a funny sort of staring thing, funny thing he's, he does. I don't know if you've noticed, he stares and he flickers his eyes about. Apparently I can't cry um, either, so I'm yet to find out. I haven't seen him cry for it. <laughs> so we should see when his sister gets married in a few weeks' time, in a couple of weeks' time, we should see if he has a tear or not, you know. One day I'll find out, I suppose, um, get hit or something, perhaps, or perhaps um, a funeral. But the curse has no sympathy. It can't sob over its trail of blight. There's work to be done. Can you imagine going from this to this? Georgina Ludden is a fun-loving blonde from Kent, and she, like thousands of others, was having the best time ever in Falaraki on roads last summer. The first week was absolutely amazing. We'd met loads of new friends. We'd um, gone to lots of different places. It played all the music we liked. But then the curse arrived in the form of some rabble-rousing Scots. We didn't speak to them that much, purely because their accents were so strong, we couldn't really understand them. Leaving the babbling Celts, Georgina went out for yet another cracking night, returning home in the early hours. I went to bed pretty much straight away, fell straight asleep. The next thing I knew, I was waking up to a pile of hair next to me. Scalped by the curse. It started clicking that this looked very much like my hair and that was the point when I put my hand to my head and realised that it was mine. At first of all, I thought, has it fallen out? And I realised it couldn't have done the way it was shorn. Perhaps it was Georgina who herself was possessed. I went into the bathroom to see if I had somehow picked up my own razor and done it to myself. Um, it was then that I saw the window was open with a trail of toilet paper going out there and that was when I guess someone had come into my room. Yes, this was a case of Scottish scissorhands. Georgina's neighbours, the bevied-up band of Bravehearts from the pool, had been on a drunken shaving binge, and she was the victim. I don't believe it's the case that people go on youth holidays looking to get into trouble and, 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 and cause problems. A small number of people will. What I do think is, is a real shame is when somebody becomes an innocent victim of those people who do want to cause trouble. You know, the girl that had her head shaved, you know, completely unacceptable. Even when you are absolutely paralytic on lager, you know what you can and can't do. And shaving your mate's hair, that's fine. Shaving a stranger's hair, that's assault. The boys each paid a €1,600 Euro fine to avoid six months in jail. Georgina just wanted to brush this whole episode under the carpet. I wanted to get back to normal as soon as I could because that is my way of dealing with things, everything getting back to normal and being treated as normal. So as soon as I got a wig, I went back to work. But the curse had her by the short and curlies. The worst thing for me was knowing that people knew, and I don't know why, but I had an irrational fear that as people knew, that everyone was going to try and take my wig off to see what I looked like. In a bid to beat the curse, she appeared on national TV to reveal the horror of her hair and then to have it re-thatched by experts. But the curse was watching, and unfortunately, she'll be remembered for one thing and one thing only. A few people have recognised me or mentioned things. A lot of people, I think, do know what's happened, but they have sort of more compassion than to walk straight up to me and say, you're that girl, because I don't want to be known as the girl who had her head shaved. 
The curse loves headlines and Aisha Bird from Wigan had no idea of the impact reports would have when she went on a well-deserved holiday, leaving her six-year-old daughter with the grandparents. I've raised my daughter on my own ever since I've had her. Um, so when I go away, I like to, to have a good time. It's, it's just a, a break from everything. She went to Gran Canaria with two girlfriends on a Club 1830 holiday to have the time of her life. Well, I don't like going on holiday to have a shit time. I go on holiday to have a good time. I make sure of it as well. Oh, God, you're So when a camera crew asked if they could chart her no-holds-barred exploits, she thought nothing of it. Little did Aisha realise that once captured on camera, behaviour like this would fuel the tabloid furnace and unleash the curse. The thing I was most embarrassed about was talking about certain parts of my body. My vagina needs feeding again. Since I've been here, it's been like, feed me, feed me. <laughs> so I got fed the other night and I got fed, was it last night? Last no, night. no, not last, not last night, the night before I got fed. I know a couple of people, they said they watched it and they were like thinking, shut up, Aisha. Shut up, Aisha, as they were watching it. So I like, yeah, I felt embarrassed. If you paid to go on an 18 to 30 holiday and didn't shag many, many blokes, or at least more than you would at home, you'd be disappointed and you'd want your money back. Yeah, I had this daft little um, challenge that I, I, I dreamed up with the girls and um, and that's what the um, the main focus of my holiday was. It was to shag a fella from all four corners of the UK. My challenge is to see the British Isles. I've done the Welsh, I've done the Irish, I've done the English, I just need to do the Scottish now. This wanton behaviour was a frank first for British TV, and she now needed a visit from north of the border to complete her bonkathon. I'm, I'm trying to find the Scottish guy here. Please. Unabashed, she trolled Scottish waters, and we watched her gog at her headline grabbing failure to make the catch. I need a Scottish man! Okay. The fact that I didn't bag a Scottish guy didn't bother me whatsoever because all of that was just a laugh anyway. You know, showing off, the, you know, the Bacardi talking. And that's what it all, that's what it was all about. Not bothered, Aisha flew home to resume her normal and sober existence, but the curse was waiting. Sex crazed Aisha. Um, no, Aisha wanted to have a good time. I had a good time. I'm not saying I didn't have sex with anybody because I did. Um, and I mean, that come from my mouth, we all know that. But um, sex crave, I mean, what does that mean? If you're a holiday maker and you go away and you shag around, you know, and there's a TV camera there and you want to tell them all about it, then fine, that's your decision. But you're quite naive to think that that programme will not then be talked about in the newspapers. It was headline news. Um, people were shocked by it. People were horrified by it. And, and I thought, well, I just thought it was a big fuss about it. But nothing, I thought, well, why? You know what I mean? I, I had a good time, and that's all I did. But the curse is ready to take advantage of any innocent. If I was single with no responsibility, then I probably would have got up to even more. But because I've got my daughter, I felt as though I'd let her down a bit. And I think that's the main thing I was worried about and concerned about. There is no getting away from the fact that sex sells newspapers now, and, and sex brings viewers to TV shows. It certainly does. And when Rachel Williams and Vanessa Rasimakis waved goodbye to their mothers and jetted off to Falaraki, they only had one thing on their minds. Uh, well, I suppose they went out on the Club 1830 holiday to have experience of sex. And they certainly did that, all right. <laughs> Having been sucked into a different moral world, Rachel and Vanessa finished their holiday and found some bar work, tabletop bar work which whetted our appetites for more, much more. We saw them audition to be pole dancers, and f frankly, we saw them tap off with every guy in town, really. However, this brazen behaviour didn't prepare them for what the curse had in store. In a bizarre twist of curse, our man Vinny was also in Falaraki as Rachel and Vanessa's willing rep. I walked out and knocked on the door, so they come in, open the door, one of them is just coming out of the shower naked and the other one shagging one on the bed. I was thinking, oh, God. The curse was actually in neutral and these girls were in overdrive, which culminated in this carry-on-esque soft porn. I'm going to get jiggy. Never before had audiences seen British youth indulging so blatantly abroad. Be quiet so we don't wake the other guests up. 
and their seedy affairs were about to reach a cursed climax. Once they'd kind of crossed the line and once they thought, right, we've done all these things, we've had threesomes and, you know, we've had same-sex affairs and things, and now we've done them on TV, then it's obviously a smaller leap then to do it and be filmed and be paid for it. They got in touch with Cathy Barry, the UK's number one porn star. I have my wicked way. <laughs> and made the lesbian porn film Filthy Club Reps. Are you a bit nervous, girls? A tad bit nervous. A tad bit nervous? How many bottles of wine have you drunk? Three. I'm in, I'm in for a good time then. <laughs> I right. think they just took a lifestyle decision, which was, well, we're having sex with everybody, we might as well film it and make some money, you know? I call that good business. But their families didn't quite see it that way. Vanessa's father was really outraged by her behaviour because I mean, this is really sad. At one point, he tried to buy back photographs and, you know, explicit videos of her that were circulating around newspapers and, um, you know, television companies, which you imagine is something really, really desperate for a dad to do, when at the same time she's hoping that they'll be out there and, and they'll be seen. But certainly Rachel regretted episodes of the whole story. At the end of the day, it was your decision to do it and it's going to be shown to millions Everybody's going to be able to buy it off the top shelf. You know, if you didn't want to do it, you shouldn't have done it in the first place. So let that be a lesson to you. Mess with the curse and your fame could end in top shelf shame. Coming up, the curse is omnipresent as it destroys a Club 1830 resort and puts a young innocent behind bars. The jail cells were awful. They were disgusting. The curse of Club 1830 can snare pretty much anyone and anything in its slightly sticky wake. And now this cursed conga has snaked its way to the Mediterranean resort and their inhabitants. No one and nothing is sacrosanct. And summer 2003 saw this dodgy dance with the dark side exposed. Booze, bonking, sleaze, sin, shame and slappers. Those places are just heinous. It's like a concrete long street, bars on either side, you're getting hashed. Come here, have a drink, have a drink. Hey, you got a big drink. Have a drink, have a drink, have a drink, have a drink, have a drink. Fucking hell. Big groups of lads running around. Oh, no, it's like New Year's Eve. It was like locusts. It's just bang, you know, drink, 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 yo, 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 scoff, 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 puke, 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 shag, 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 off they went. They're young lads and girls. They can't handle their drink. They've been in the sun all the day. It makes it worse. Fights break out, people get arrested, people get naked. What a nightmare. But some people love it. And so the world turns. You know, you get people who are young and what do young people want to do? They don't want to go to B&Q on a Sunday. They don't want to watch Alan Titchmarsh talking about life on Earth. They want to go on holiday and have the time of their lives because we're a long time dead. In 2003, a new kind of victim fell into the ever-widening web of curse. 19-year-old Gemma Gunning was neither rep nor holidaymaker, merely working in Falaraki, handing out flyers. But the curse caught up with her on a night out. The Eurovision thong contest, all you had to do is go out on stage wearing a thong and you bar if you wanted to, I think. It was then that the MC suggested that Gemma obscure her assets with stickers rather than a bra to add to the entertainment. They were quite quite large, they were about this big. Um, decided that would be a good idea for me to stick them over my boobs. The crowd was shouting more, more, more. Um, so I took the stickers off and after that I was dancing for all of about five seconds and I was led off the stage and a man grabbed me by the arm and said in very broken English, you're coming with me. Picked up by the fuzz, Gemma was immediately imprisoned. You're stepping outside of the UK um, and you're presuming that because you're with British people and because you're going to the British bar and having a breakfast and all this kind of stuff, that you're at home, you know, but with greater weather and, and more cash and more women. You're not, you're in someone else's country and people forget that. And, I think a lot of the time people are genuinely shocked and upset when they get in trouble. It was only the next day, in the dock, she realised how well the curse had her covered. I think nearly every newspaper that I can think of was in court that day. 
Found guilty of exposing herself in public, Gemma had to pay €2,500 to escape jail. So, from good time innocent to booze, bonking, sleaze, sin, shame, slapper, she was cursed. I had a lot of press coverage, so there was a lot of lies written in there. A paper saying that I had had 18 lovers when I hadn't. They were all lies. I don't know where they got it from. And then the ultimate tabloid insult. I was offered money to do page three, yes, but I turned it down. Why? Because they weren't going to pay enough money. Whooping with the joy, the curse returned to Greece to concentrate on its main course, the very resort itself. Some years, uh, tell me something, some years it was the right place to come and now it's not. Suddenly in a year everything changed. First everybody wanted to come in Fariraki and in one year, in three months, everything changed. Explain that, I, I cannot understand that. It is indeed difficult to understand, but this is the curse. Bring together an unholy alliance of young Brits and local entrepreneurs and you'll get the headlines that have reduced Falaraki to a shadow of its former self. Gorged on and spat out by the curse of Club 1830. There was this kind of um, expectation that it's being so built up, at some point it will fall down. And I think people were going there um, from a press point of view and reporting on it and actually being quite shocked and coming away with the idea that there's no way that this can continue. The image that was portrayed in the UK press was total bollocks. It was nonsense. It was just magnified to sort of a story. That's all it was. And obviously, it's hurt this resort. They give plowing people with drinks, and then people are doing mad stuff in a bar, tits out, or whatever, and it becomes the norm. It's like, oh, so it's no big deal. Then the press comes down on it, and it, you know, you realise that actually, yeah, I was being a bit out of order, maybe. With the tourists gone, the mayor of Falaraki has a radical solution to win them back. We had some bad incidents, some bad things happened. Now I would hug the kids more and help them have an even nicer holiday. We want the young people here. We want the back. That could be wishful thinking, George, because the past holds many clues to the future. Club in the 30s, they... The history indicates that they go to a resort, they build it up, and then two or three years later they move out and move to another resort. They've done it with Ayanapa, done it with Falaraki, moved to uh, Zanti, now they're moving everyone to Mexico. So it's off to Cancun in Mexico for the summer. Mm, poor Cancun. If I was looking for a holiday and it was the last holiday on Earth and it was a Club 18 to 30 holiday, I wouldn't touch it with the barge pole. Absolute fucking nightmare. The majority of people now are becoming more independently minded and they're not looking for those kind of holidays anymore. There are others who are not so convinced of the curse. It makes the news, it creates big headlines, but actually, you know, what's wrong with a few drinks? What's wrong with having a great time? We, we all like to do that. Now, whether it be sex acts on the beach, whether it be the club rep, uh, showed you her boobs or showed you his bum. It all goes in there and when you're 70 and 75, reduced to watching Cliff Richard on television, those memories keep you warm, I'm telling you. Or cursed. We're all going on a summer holiday No more working for a week or two Fun and laughter on a summer holiday No 